that. All right, well, um, this is the time in the evening, which is uh, one of my favourite times, when we get to uh, speak with someone who is uh, an expert uh, in their field and some uh, real uh, knowledge to share. So uh, on screen we've got a, uh, a good-looking chap, um, and his name is uh, Mark Grant. He is uh, he spent a uh, ton of time in the uh, banking industry. So worked for Westpac, uh, worked in business banking, uh, and um, was helping businesses uh, with their uh, their business lending and their business needs, uh, you know, financially. Uh, but I think there must have been some point where uh, where Mark had said, "Hey, look, <laughs> I've had enough. It's uh, it's time to leave." Or uh, I don't know whether. Uh, whether it was sort of an intentional leaving or got made redundant and uh, sort of uh, end up in the uh, in the scrap heap of uh, being uh, older than the age of 30, so uh, you're unemployable uh, in, uh, in business, so uh, do as uh, what uh, many of us have done and decide that uh, the entrepreneurial seizure to uh, start your own business is uh, probably the best way to go. So Mark's a small business owner. He's uh, been running his business uh, Costless Payment Solutions for four years now. And uh, he's offering some interesting and innovative ideas in um, business and finance for uh, small business owners. So um, good to have you on, uh, have you along, Mark. And um, thanks for uh, thanks for being with us tonight. Pleasure, Nick. Long time no see. It has been, isn't it? <laughs> Mark and I go to a uh, networking meeting uh, sort of every sort of Thursday fortnight, so uh, we see each other reasonably regularly as well. All right. Well, look, um, tonight's going to be a wee bit different in that. Um, there's no presentation, but we're going to run it uh, interview style. Uh, I, well, I don't think you've got a PowerPoint, have you, Mark? No. No, no, great, great. Um, so we're going to run it uh, interview style and uh, really sort of draw out some of uh, Mark's uh, expertise and uh, knowledge uh, tonight. So probably first place to start is uh, banking. You know, when I think about banking, uh, it, it, it never feels that exciting, really. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, but I know you, and uh, and you're a little bit more exciting than uh, than the topic itself with your sort of big banks. Um, but maybe just tell us a wee bit about your backstory and uh, and how you got to be where you are today. Yeah, thanks, Nick. Um, thanks everyone for joining tonight too, and uh, for those watching the recording. Yeah, as as Nick stated, I I spent over twenty years with Westpac, um, both in Brisbane and also here on the Gold Coast. So, it came. I was actually struck by a lightning bolt, not literally, but that, that's what I like to refer to it as. It came, I came to a crossroads in my career at, at Westpac where, <clears throat> pardon me, the continual uh, pummeling of businesses, clubs and associations of fees and charges just didn't sit with me any longer. I just couldn't, couldn't continue to do so. So I had to do what, was, what I thought was right by my conscience and leave. So as you can imagine, leaving an employer after 20 odd years is quite a big step to take. And uh, so I had every intention of having a six month off to uh, de Westpacify, as I call it. Unfortunately, the six months turned into pretty close to three years. Because as Nick mentioned in the intro, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm on the other side of 50. And uh, you know, there's no such thing in our country here in Australia as uh, age discrimination at all. <laughs> no, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for your comment, Martin. Too. Um, so, as you know, what actually happened is I applied for 140 roles in my skill set here on the Gold Coast, not in banking, but just in you know, in um, you know relationship management and things of that nature. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, had no luck. So I just thought, well, it's something's going to something's going to give. So. As they say, if you can't find a job, you've got to make it. So primarily, that, that's what happened. Um, so what actually happened is, um, as I said, I had almost three years unemployed. Um, so it gave me a lot of time to think, a lot of time to plan. So what actually happened in September 2017, that's when a real sort of a crucial part of the puzzle uh, presented itself to me. So what that was is that was the federal government um, introducing certain Chance law into our country. So it, it's a very, very interesting um, field. Um, without a word of a lie, and no disrespect to any of the uh, people on the call this evening, um, if I was to go out into the street, whether I'd be in, in the Gold Coast, Brisbane, or Sydney, or I wouldn't go on the street in Melbourne, no disrespect. <laughs> but if you went out in the street and you asked people what, you know, what, what the surcharge laws are, 
I'll guarantee you'd get 10 different answers. Yeah, even in business, it's a little bit uh, misunderstood. So I hope tonight that I can sort of allay a few of your fears, um, also wipe away a little bit of the doubt that you may have about it. But yeah, that's sort of the background, Nick. So, uh, Pardon me. We'll, we'll come back to that surcharge because um, I didn't even know about it. I, yeah, it's like this is a, a really new thing for me. I've been in business for what twenty odd years, and um, no clues about this. So you know, I'm, I'm clueless about some areas, but you know, we still get by. Um, so, um, so, so three years unemployed, um, mm. and uh, and then starting your own business. That that must have been a uh, well, fairly interesting period I, uh, of time, I guess. I mean, <laughs> self, yes. self, self esteem takes a bit of a hit, I guess, during that sort of time as well. Yeah, it, it, it does. Yeah, it does. And uh, in the three years I was, I was unemployed, um, I've got a nice piece of Italian hardware here behind me. You can't see it. It's a, a road bike, so I did a lot of cycling in that three years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so yeah, absolutely. Self, self esteem did, did take a, a um, yeah. Uh, a, a real dent, but um, in in saying that, I just had to, you know, I had my goals, and I I, I firmly believe that you know he, he was a, uh, here was a storm that I was in, you know, and I was going to come out the other side of it, be a better mm. person for it. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's uh, and look, it's interesting that um, we're well, not interesting, but I, I, you know, I'm probably commendable also that you know having spent so many years in a corporate environment, then you step over to the other side, the people that you are helping. Uh, and have uh, joined the uh, the rank and file of uh, small business as yeah. well too. So uh, I think one of the strengths that you obviously have is understanding you know both sides of that equation because you've been in uh, both sides of uh, of that equation as well too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank so, uh, so I mean, just in terms of uh, banking, uh, that's an interesting uh, aspect in, in its own right. Like as a banker, um, how. Ha- ha- how did you view diff, uh, business, and how was it? How did you view business differently uh, to how how you are now being in business and viewing the banks? Uh, we've got ladies on the call, Nick. I can't answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, very, very good. Um, yeah, I always, I've always thought of myself as a little different, a um, little bit outside the square at times, and that's how I think. So when I was in, in the banking game, unfortunately, all I was doing is, whether I liked it or not, no disrespect meant to the shareholders of the banks, all I was trying to do was improve their returns. Because ultimately, that's, that's what I was, I was effectively doing, you know, um, when I think about it. So what was really important to me, and it's, it sort of followed me, and it will stay with me while I'm in business as well, is that quite simply, is if I'm helping a client now, you are not a one-off transaction to me. That's not who I am. It's not where I'm going. It's not who I want to be. So when, when a client does business with me, they're actually a client and friend for life. So, and, and what I intend to do during that, that period of our relationship is to impart over 20 odd years of banking and finance knowledge to them as well. And that's what I'm basically doing as well in a day in, day in, you know, day, in day out basis. So... Uh, so, so it's, you talk about uh, you know so being, working in the uh, in an institution that uh, you know one of your major roles there is to provide a return for shareholders. Uh, yet one of the things I see in small business um, is that uh, we're often trying to provide a better return for our customers than we are for our shareholders, us being the shareholder. So many small businesses will go uh, above and beyond to uh, serve their customers, to make sure that they're happy and uh, that they're the real winners in the equation, uh, sometimes even the, at the expense of the business and the uh, business owner. Anyone relate to that at all? <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so, and I think possibly somewhere in the middle there, is probably a happy medium for uh, you know for business where you're serving the shareholders and uh, you know your customers. It's a two-way transaction. Yeah, absolutely. I think you know really I, I believe no matter what uh, business you have now, and I don't care the, the size of your business. I think one of the very very interesting attributes that you must have as a business owner is initiative. And also, I do believe it's it's very very um, 
let me say a, a trait that should have is to be open-minded too because it, it's quite often it's quite often that um that what i do face is i face when i'm talking to to businesses about the word surcharge as an example um you know most people will say to me mark i don't believe in it mark never never liked it mark you know and as you know nick here in queensland is that when we when we go and fill up our cars We've got a few. We've got a fuel surcharge built into the fuel price. Have so if you don't like surcharge here in Queensland, yep, certainly do. Fit the state government's got a surcharge built into the fuel price. So, 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 so tell us about these surcharges. What what is it like? Like the uh, petrol one, I do know. I do know yeah, about that one. I was yeah. just been flipping it with that. But um, <laughs> but you talk about surcharge laws. What's all that about? Yeah. So. But as I said uh, earlier on, back in September 2017, federal federal government brought into play a uh, a, a natural uh, a national law. That law, and I'm just going to abbreviate as best I can for for everyone. That law states that if you're in business, and a business club or association, I must uh, must elaborate there, and you're accepting a card payment for a payment of your goods or services you're able to pass back to your consumer the cost of doing business for that transaction. Now, with those last few words, doing business for that transaction, that's where the gray area is and the question marks are around that. Because no matter if you are a um, Zarafa's franchisee operating a coffee shop here on the Gold Coast, or whether you are um, you know, a lawnmower person or whether you're an accountant, you are being charged all different rates by your financial institution for the payment solutions that they have provided to you. So it, it's a real grey area and I will, I will stand by my work right now that there are a lot of people, I, I, I would hate to think how many are out there, now who are presently charging their own private surcharge to their clients but they are not complying with the law and as a result of not complying with the law face fines up to one hundred and twenty six thousand dollars wow so that's, that's a significant um uh, issue then oh absolutely i don't know about you nick i don't have one twenty six thousand dollars in my back not, not last time i checked anyway <laughs> no no i think uh, it's in the mattress somewhere but yeah <laughs> So, so, so when you're talking about surcharges, what you're talking about is um, the the fees that you get charged as a business for uh, accepting credit cards, FPOS, debit cards, all that sort of thing there. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly right, exactly right. What I might do is I might just um, I might just elaborate on that for a bit, a, a minute longer, and give you give everyone a real life example I came across. Um, it was pre pre COVID, so it was towards the end of last year. So I was up in Brisbane helping uh, my sister and her husband uh, do some renovations on their property up there. And the, the brother-in-law said, Mark, can you go to local hardware and pick up some, you know, some bits and pieces, which, you know, no problem. So I walked into this hardware store, all I needed, and I was about to pay by my MasterCard. So I put everything through and they're going to charge me 3%. I'm thinking, oh my goodness, that's a bit, a bit exorbitant. So, Luckily, at that time, I had some cash money, so I paid for the goods using cash. Uh, go forward a couple of weeks in time, I followed that up because what was important to me is I would not feel comfortable in myself knowing that I'd come across someone there. You know, I wasn't about trying to sell a product to that person in that business. I was more about providing an education around the surcharge. So I had no doubt in the world whatsoever that this particular business owner was passing on what he thought was the correct surcharge. So to give you an example, um, he, believe it or not, he had his FPOS facility with Westpac. So with, with Westpac, they were charging him on FPOS transactions, 60 cents a transaction. They were charging him with MasterCard and Visa, um, 2% per transaction. And with Amex, they were charging him 3%. So naturally, <coughs> excuse me, he thought 
that he was well within his right to charge every card holder. I don't mean, I don't care if you are using an FBOS card, MasterCard, Visa, or whatever. Every card holder was charged three percent. So we had a little bit of an interesting discussion himself and myself. And I just said to him, okay, look, sorry, you're not contravening with the law. And I gave him, I thought, well, I'm going to give you two options here. I'm going to give you an option on, on which surcharge of the 60 cents per transaction, the 2% that you can use to pass on to everyone. Unfortunately, he chose the wrong option again. He chose the 2%. So the moral of the story is, a business is able to pass on its own private surcharge. No issue whatsoever. However, in this example here, the only surcharge that that uh, hardware store could pass on to every cardholder was 60 cents a transaction, the lowest cost denominator. So the moral of the story there is, sure, he could pass on to everyone 60 cents, charge everyone 60 cents, however, Westpac would still charging two dollars. I'm uh, sorry, two percent for Mastercard and Visa cards being used, and three percent for Amex. So the moral of the story is, he'd be going through the back door quicker than he knows it. So we spent some time, a few hours together, and I went through and just showed him. You know, I explained that in. You know, I'm a bit of a drawer, to be honest with you. And so I, I showed him. You know what I was talking about there, and what I also did is I also calculated that if he was to pass on the surcharge that is now um, permitted by law to be done for every card going through, that I could save him over $80,000 a year in his bank fees. Wow. $80,000. $80,000 a year is paying to Westpac for his FPOS. Yep. Wow. So, so you're not talking about chump change here. You're talking about significant yeah. Uh, money. Yeah. I use that as an example because... This particular gentleman, and I'm not denigrating him or attacking him in any shape or form, that's not who I am or not where I come from. It's just that there is a lot of people out in our, in our broad open land that we have here running their business misinformed or uninformed. So that's why it was important to me to be able to have this as a platform tonight to try and educate people on what can be done, and what to use. Mm. And who to come to if they need questions asked. So, so in terms of in terms of that sur surcharge, uh, so what what is that? Uh, what, what can you do? Like, um, uh, you know, obviously, if you charge the lowest amount that's permissible, uh, that's that's within the law. But obviously, you're paying more than uh, than you need to on the surcharges. If you pay the uh, the highest amount, then um, you're obviously contravening the law because it's. Um, <laughs> Yeah, you know, you're charging people more for it. So as I understand it, uh, the, the law is is really a cost recovery law. You can't make a profit from the surcharge. Correct. That's exactly right, Nick. Exactly right. So, you know, it, it was a little bit hard for this particular gentleman to um, understand when I started, you know, saying to him, well, look, you know, if you continue to pass on a 60 cent surcharge every card holder, you're going to be paying Westpac more, which is effectively what he would do. So that 80K that I've saved him, if he stayed at Westpac, probably would have gone to 100K, if not more. Mm -hmm. yes. So, yeah, so cut a long story short, um, he's now using one of my FPOS terminals. And the benefit about using mine as opposed to Westpac is not only the saving, but what the terminal that I do automatically calculates and passes on the respective surcharge for the card being used for payment. So it can identify between a debit card and a MasterCard. So that's the technology of, of design within the FPOS terminal that I provide. So, so that means they're fully compliant uh, and so um, they've, they've got a sort of like, I guess, a zero cost in terms of their transactions with the bank yeah that, that's right yeah exactly right Nick. yeah so um so that must mean there's a lot of businesses out there who are pretty much non-compliant yeah it um it scares it scares me to think to think that but i have no doubt there are yeah yeah so and it's it's probably probably just as important for um the people on the call tonight and those listening is that if you do um 
if you do, um, I'll come back to your question. Thank you, Terry. Um, is if you walk into a business and um, and please, I'm not attacking coffee shops in any shape or form. I'm a I'm a very very much a, a coffee drinker in my own right. Um, but if you walk into a coffee shop, and I had this um, example from someone in Sydney the other day, they walked in and they went to pay for their coffee a five dollars. Suddenly they're going to be paying seventy cents extra on top. Now. The law states quite simply that if you as a business owner are going to be passing on a surcharge to your client and here I'm talking here about shop fronts for a moment. So if you've got a shop front and you're going to be passing on a surcharge, you must have a sign visible to your clients coming in to your in this example coffee shop. So primarily on maybe on your front door and near your cash register that you're actually passing on a surcharge and it must list individually, the surcharge rates that you're going to be charging. For example, FBOS 60 cents, MasterCard Visa 2%, Amex 3%. So, so you're legally required to have that. If you don't have it, then you can't charge it. Yeah. And, and what, what, I, what I will do too is that um, for those who, who operate in the, uh, in the online world, uh, you can still certainly pass on a surcharge. But, you know, obviously uh, for compliance, uh, you know, to take care of the compliance space, what you must do is actually put on your website, obviously, that, you know, you, you to keep your costs low, you're now passing on the following surcharges and list them there. So, uh, so for those online payments, you're still required to have a notice there, you can't just... Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. You just can't have a surcharge waiting for the shopper at your, at your, on your shopping cart. Okay, so I haven't seen many of those signs around on people's businesses. Uh, no. <laughs> no, very, very true. Uh, and, and I know for a fact here on the Gold Coast already that um, the, a, the ACCC uh, are out in force um, going into businesses here on the Gold Coast at the moment. And uh, yes, I, I know of a business, I think it was three weeks ago now here on the coast that um, got slapped with, I think it was a $95,000 fine. Wow. And uh, because they, they didn't have the sign or they, they were just charging the wrong surcharges? Uh, um, they, were, um, they were both A and B, Nick. They were both. A and B. So, it was, yep, combination. Yep. Yep. Okay. So, um, so the easiest solution is um, to, to be within the law is just not to pass on the surcharge. Um, yeah, or B is to sort of... Um, consult with someone who's obviously needing to be licensed under the law. Oh, so you need to be licensed for this? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I had to I had to seek um, licensing like the banks have got. Um, yeah. I'm not, not as big as the banks, obviously. <laughs> so, yeah, I had to obtain a license as the banks have got to be able to provide what I do. Yes. Right. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so, so we're talking about physical premises, you know, like uh, easy to see, say a coffee shop or, uh, you know, Mitre 10 or, you know, one of those uh, businesses there. What, uh, what about uh, service-based businesses? Like a lot of people here that operate uh, either from a home office or operate virtually uh, that are taking payments, um, you know, maybe, you know, where, how do you put your sign up? <laughs> you know, yeah, how, yeah. How, how are you compliant with, you know, when that's the case? Yeah, yeah. great question. Um... What I always suggest people to do in that sort of situation is let's let's go. I, I say more is more is better than less. So in that example, what I'm saying is that okay, you have a you have a Facebook page, so you put it up on your Facebook page that you're passing on a surcharge. Obviously, a website, uh, maybe make a note on your LinkedIn profile. So, in other words, sort of saturate your social media sphere that that's what you're doing. Uh, According to what I've studied in the law, is that if you do that, um, you're compliant with the law. Okay, so so there's an opportunity for people to know because you've published it, you've got it out there, and uh, it's compliant. Can you can you get those? Uh, like, uh, is there a standard notice you can download from a government site anywhere, or? Um... Because there okay. is for re I think there is for <laughs> refund policy. <laughs> but, yeah. Um... Um, yeah. Look, uh, there is not. Um, however, I have one here with me. So with the FBOS terminals that I provide specifically, um, they come out with one. So we, are, we supply that with the machine. So when, when you get the machine, you've got an A4 sign that's already 
pre-populated with your rates on it. So it's right, ready to go. So it's all there, yeah. Um, so with, um, you know, with the machines, like typically what those FPOS machines get supplied by the banks or sort of third parties? Um, yeah, and, so... And they come with a fee, don't they? Yeah, yeah. So, um, so I'm not, not attacking Westpac again, but... Um, but we'll go ahead it, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so if you, if you were to apply for an FPOS machine with Westpac, take into account the monthly fees that they charge you and also the transaction fees that you'd be paying for the transactions going through, you could be looking, you know, on average 15, 20 K per year. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, and I know that when I've looked at uh, those machines there uh, for my business, which is a virtual business, um, I couldn't see the sense in um, you know, renting one of their machines and paying all the fees. Uh, even though, uh, you know, the likes of, uh, say, Stripe or PayPal have uh, higher transaction fees, it was still a lot cheaper than, um, you know, using the solutions provided by the banks. Yeah, absolutely. Um, in, in going into this business, uh, as I said, four years ago, one of, and, and it's, this is still sort of a, um, a struggle I have even to, even today, is people knowing that someone like me exists. Because not, not only, you know, do you have to take time out of your business to go to your bank, you then may have to sit there and, you know, wait for an appointment that, you know, runs over. So you've got all those, all those factors of time. And, you know, that's one of the things I learned in, 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 in business, uh, sorry, in banking itself, that if you were to give a business owner a document, yay thick, for an FPOS application, you might as well open your mouth because it's going to get shoved down there pretty quickly by them. <laughs> so what, what I've done is I've, I've taken all those sort of things into context with what I'm doing now. I've sort of streamlined all my processes accordingly. And that is what I do is, is if someone needs a facility from me, whether it be one of the three that I, four I provide, is that I provide a two page PDF document listing the information I require and then what happens from there is that's then copied and pasted into the application sent to you for signing. So I'm about trying to streamline not only your time, but also obviously reduce all those cost factors. Hmm. Actually, it seems like you've got forward. Karen says, yes, uh, knowing that we exist as a common business, uh, a, a common problem <laughs> amongst us in, uh, in small business. Yeah, absolutely, so, Karen. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so let's let's get back to these online payments. We've got a question there from uh, Terry, uh, which uh, she says she only does uh, online payments using Stripe. Don't have any physical storefront. Uh, what sort of alternatives are there uh, for someone like her? Yeah, good good question, Terry. Uh, I'm just going to speak generally now, um, and without knowing anything further, um, I've had a lot of people using Stripe and the PayPal's um, online payment gateway solutions. <coughs> pardon me, that in, in the event of that particular person using, say, zero as an example, zero accounting software, what will happen is that um, I have been able to assist them with a payment solution within zero, whereby it still gives the client the ability, once you email them an a invoice through zero, to actually still have the ability to pay by credit card. So where, uh, so what it's doing is it's sort of integrate, zero is sort of integrating into their website and sort of formalizing the invoice, sending the invoice out for payment, payments received and then goods are sent out. That's option A. Option B is I certainly do provide um, an online payment gateway solution whereby the surcharge is able to be on forwarded to the, um, to and shopping uh, on average you're looking at uh, per transaction around about the around about the two percent just rule of thumb okay and so that, that would take into account the card that they're using and, and yeah it runs through all the valid verification your verification of the card yeah security okay. the whole lot. okay so um so let's uh, play uh, sort of devil's advocate uh, here <laughs> i was afraid of that yeah <laughs> 
Um, and, and look, some people would say, well, well, why bother about uh, surcharges anyway? Why not just increase your prices by an average amount and, um, and, and then not bother about charging a surcharge at all? Yeah, great, great question. Um, one that's posed to me many times every day. So my response normally is, okay, if you increase your prices, fine. A, a majority of your clients will stay with you because they know you and us humans uh, don't like change. Um, so what actually happens is that if you increase your prices, you may drive people to your competitors. So you're actually going to be giving your competitors a, uh, you know, let's say a free ride. Um, in, in, the, in that sort of situation, you know, I, I suppose it comes back, how, how can you keep continually increasing your prices? Because eventually, um, you know, people will start, what's the, what's, the, what's the thing that we sleep with just about every night under our pillows? These things. So people are now becoming more, more savvy in, in their shopping, more savvy in trying to get opinions. So, you know, someone will find out that, you know, <coughs> pardon me, you know, in Martin's example, someone may find, oh, well, I, I can buy, you know, I can buy a Bianchi bike at, you know, three suburbs away, $300 cheaper than what Martin could sell it to me for. So it, you know, it, it's within realms, but it's something that I would certainly keep under, um, let me say, strict reins. Mm. So particularly when you're talking about a commoditized world where, um, you know, sort of, uh, you know when, when you're buying a commodity, whether you buy it from one store or another store, uh, often doesn't make any difference. At that point there, people are uh, often shopping on price and convenience. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's, you know, I always firmly believe even in the banking industry that there was more to a particular deal or a purchase than price alone. Mm. You know, because, you know, when you're going out to buy a brand new motor car now, you know, something that, that's worth considering is, you know, the servicing costs, you know, are you going to get five years, you know, free servicing on a, you know, a brand new BMW or whatever, or are you only going to get two years on a, you know, a Toyota? So they're sorts of factors you've still got to take into account as well. Mm. And I suppose, uh, you know, if you think about the surcharge as well, uh, you know, from a psychological perspective as a business owner, you know, if I saw $20,000 sitting in my uh, end of year accounts as bank fees, I mean, uh, every time I see the bank fees anyway, it's like, where did these come from? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, look, good. good. Um, thanks, Nick. Um, well, I, you know, I, I've probably got people thinking surcharge, you know, oh, look, it's probably $5 per transaction, things like that. Actual fact, it's not. So, if I can just, I, I just, um, just want to just harp back just for a moment back to an FBOS terminal, and I know we may have a lot of people here in the, in their online businesses, but I just want to use this as an example. So, assert primarily what I've got is I've got um, what I call rack rates. So these are the standard rates that I, that I charge. So if someone is is buying, let let's use. Um, you know, Meyer as an example, let's say they're using one of my terminals. Someone is in there buying, you know, a lady's in there buying a dress for $100, paying by her MasterCard. A rough rule of thumb, my surcharge on that transaction would be, bad example for Meyer, but let's use it, would be no more than $2 on a $100 purchase. So I want you just to turn your mind back because uh, I know you've probably seen a lot in the press of late about banks removing ATMs across our country. But if you were to go into your local club or um, hotel tonight, go to the ATM inside the door and you know get a, a you know $20 cash out, most times you'd probably be paying $4 surcharge for getting that cash out of that ATM. I know. Uh, that, that really irks me. Like... <laughs> yeah, so I firmly believe you've got to compare apples with apples and not apples with oranges. Yeah. So, uh, so what you're saying is that those terminals, actually, how do those terminals charge so much money? Oh, the, the, the ATM, the ATM, ATM machines. Isn't that a surcharge? Um, no, that's that's sort of um, they call that a a, um, a service cost. That's the official word for it. Service cost. So, so what, 
So what if I was in business and said that uh, I was just charging a service cost and not a surcharge? Surely I could do that, couldn't I? <laughs> oh, so you've got that $130,000 parked away in there, okay? <laughs> So it doesn't matter what you call it, right? <laughs> no. So, um, so in terms of, uh, uh, I mean, it's, it's easy for, uh, to understand it from the point of view of physical goods and physical transactions, and I can certainly see it from a uh, point of view. If you've got lots of transactions going through, um, then uh, you're going to have lots of surcharges going through, which uh, mount up to be sort of quite uh, significant. Um, uh, for, for big, if you've got bigger transactions, does it work out to be about the same? Um, look, it, it, uh, no. It would be a bigger, a larger saving. So once again, um, comparing apples with oranges. So what, what I normally do is that with some of the larger um, businesses I'm dealing with, and this is no detriment spoken about anyone in smaller businesses, but with, you know, volume of transactions going through, that's where we've got a little bit of, uh, let me say, leeway in, there, in, in my pricing model and what I can actually price things at for that thing but just something else while I think of it that came to mind that's quite pertinent when we're talking about payment solutions and that was um, you know I don't know if anyone has seen it of late it's been in the press over the last couple of weeks Commonwealth Bank have been having outages on, on yeah. through you know yeah. through their solutions so um, very very important to to understand and I'm not going to um, attack the CBA however one of the things that was very important to me in designing, especially the FPOS solution that I provide, is that I can guarantee 100% reliability at any time, anywhere. So your, yours, yours are not going to go down? No, no. I've got a, got a business, believe it or not, out the back of the Kimberleys over in WA. As bad as remote as remote you can get. Um, they've had my terminal uh, operation for nine, uh, two and a half years now. Um, have not had one outage yet. I'm in regular contact with them. So even though the banks are going down, your machines are not going down? Yep. All right. That's, that, that's probably sort of fairly significant for a, <laughs> for a business because, I mean, yeah. some of those bank outages, they're, they're becoming more and more uh, prevalent. I mean, there's been Commonwealth, there's been National Bank of Australia. Yeah, Westpac had it too. Westpac as well too, so, yeah. So what about... Um, uh, and I suppose we've got to raise it too because, uh, I mean, I've been in the process of uh, opening up uh, bank accounts um, and uh, one of the, um, uh, because I deal internationally as well too, I make a lot of purchases internationally and I've got uh, international uh, clients as well. Uh, we're dealing here in Australia with uh, the surcharge laws. Um, when you're dealing sort of internationally, how, how does that uh, play out as well? Are, are we governed by the same laws? Uh, when uh, the, when we're sort of um, charging or not charging surcharges, or can we, uh, can we do what we like with overseas customers? Um, I'd like to say you can do what you like, Nick, but you can't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so effectively, um, the responsibility comes back to where the payment's being collected. So in other words, it's being collected here in Australia. So with, an, with, with you accepting international cards, whether it be on your... When you're through your website, whether it be through a recurring payment solution or whether it be through an FPOS solution, it's, it's roughly um, at least 1% on top of what my standard rates are. Okay, so even though we're dealing overseas, uh, we're governed over here. It doesn't matter what country's paying us, we're still governed by the law here. Yep. Are, are we also governed by any laws overseas? So like we're transacting with uh, US clients, for instance, is there any impact on um, on us over here as far as compliance and fees are concerned from that country? Uh, no. No? So it's only here? Only here, yeah. Okay, great. And um, and if you happen to have an, uh, an entity in Singapore, you run your business from Singapore, I'm probably getting a bit, uh, bit too far outside of things at the moment, but um, you know, we, we do have a client who runs an outsourcing business. He runs it from uh, Singapore, operates in the Philippines. We buy and supply... Uh, from him uh, in in uh, from and to him in Australia. Uh, yes. So there's governed a, by the laws here. Yeah. So it's all, all here. All right. Well, that, well, that makes it sort of uh, good, good and clear and uh, simple. So uh, I mean, the way I see it too is we're we're heading towards a uh, cashless society. 
sure. um, as uh, and I think our current situation uh, at the moment has really uh, sped up that process because people are or well, and certainly um, uh, you know the shops that we're dealing with are preferring now uh, you know contactless solutions and cashless uh, solutions as well so um, uh, so I would imagine the banks would be uh, rubbing their hands with glee uh, with that there because um, we could expect some uh, some greater profitability there. In fact, the, the banks now are more profitable than um, than they have been. Isn't that the case? Yeah, exactly right. So, in case you don't know, the um, the banks here in Australia are amongst the most profitable banks in the world. So that and has they have been for at least at least the last fifteen years that, that I can remember anyway. Mm. So yeah, um, the last study I did, ninety seven point four percent of all transactions here in Australia. Are done by card and it's a good good point you make nick because um yes we're, we're being we're being directed down that uh cashless path uh in in doing uh doing our shopping our transactions um you know i have read uh, s several articles stating that we will be a cashless society here in australia by 2023 so you know here we are towards the end of you know 20 yeah 2020 um so it's not it's not too distant so I, I suppose what it also does it opens up um you know the the conundrum about you know you know the rise of cryptocurrency uh which is um you know started to start to really you know shake shake the tree a little as well mm -hmm. uh, so we just talking about crypto for a moment um i've got that on my drawing board at the moment so we're tossing around i'm tossing around a few ideas there at the moment so I would not expect that I'd have anything in the crypto field available until perhaps you know towards the end of next year at the earliest. Well, it, it, and it's interesting uh, looking at some of that crypto as well too. There's a, a fish and chip shop uh, down in Southport uh, where you can uh, use cryptocurrency to buy fish and chips, and uh, using it through a Mastercard or, or Visa you know solution so it's yeah. sort of tap and go with it as well yeah there used to be a used to be a crypto atm i don't know if it's still there in in surface paradise yeah so um you know so they're interesting complexities and who, who knows uh, how that's going to affect things uh, legally as well too um yes. and and i think there's a whole uh, a whole new area i mean it's probably too new at the moment for uh, it's not really in mainstream yet so you've got early adopters in there you've got people that are uh, trading crypto and and speculating on it, but it's not really uh, mainstream yet. But when we think about it, uh, when we're using visas and Mastercards, that's cryptocurrency. It just happens to be controlled by um, you know institutions, global institutions and institutions here. So, yeah, the um, so true. The, the one of the things I was thinking of that uh, and, and you know the comment about the uh, cashless society as well is that. Um, with more and more transactions being transacted, uh, you know, via card electronically and digitally, uh, then the opportunities for, um, what's a good way to put this? Um, for, for maybe getting away with charging uh, too much in terms of uh, uh, fees. So like if you just run down and just say, so I'm just gonna charge a high 3%. Um, all of that stuff now uh, is, is being recorded in some way, shape or form uh, electronically. And so um, how easy would it be for, uh, say, uh, the ACCC to, to go through bank transactions looking for businesses that have overcharged the, um, uh, the transaction fees? Very, very easy. Um, that's primarily part of the reason why that business I mentioned earlier to you was actually caught. So they were caught um, in two reasons. Was the ACCC doing that investigation you spoke of through transactions that had been going through? And secondly, someone else just had been, you know, this business had this person there on the wrong day. So this person was very well informed about surcharge laws. It wasn't me. <laughs> um, so they were very well informed and they knew exactly that that was untoward, not lawful. And, and they actually made a, uh, a complaint, uh, well, it's outside, once I went outside, so... Those two things led to this investigation and that fine coming through. Right, and once so, a complaint's made, then um, the government or the government authorities legally obliged absolutely. to investigate it as well. And, absolutely, and, you know, 
exactly right. Yeah, yeah. So interesting times. If if you were to give um, uh, any last words of advice. Uh, for businesses in terms of their um, transactions and cash and even just doing business in terms of what you've seen uh, you know in the time in your years in banking and in business uh, what, what would be your top two or three things that um, yeah. you would give yeah firstly um, if you have a loan would it be an investment loan for a property a home loan a commercial loan or a commercial property if you have not met with your banker over the last 12 months, I'd make that a priority. Because I know from my days at Westpac that if the client didn't sing out about, hey, give me a better deal, we would continue to charge you at the current rate. So no doubt there are people perhaps on this call that are being charged the incorrect rate at this stage with rates falling to the lowest level probably since I was born. Um, a few years ago now. Um, so that would be, <laughs> so I would strongly recommend that. Um, and then secondly, with, with regard to your payment solutions, so whether you've got an online payment gateway, FBOS term or a combination of both, also it's worth going or making time to talk to your banker and have them stick their neck out and prove to you why you should be banking with them as opposed to vice versa. Because as you probably know now, uh, there are people like me in the marketplace. Our economy now, um, our economy. Yeah. We, we've gone through a, a complete um, renaissance, if I can call it that, um, from what's happened in, in, in the banking world. So it's deregulated now. So there's so many more players in the marketplace. But thirdly, if you're in the market for a loan, and let me just say you've gone through a broker and brokers provide an excellent level of service. If your broker has come to you and said, hey, Nick, I've got the loan for you and your wife. Uh, we're going to source it from Westpac. Before I would be putting pen to paper, I would be one, asking the broker why Westpac, and two, I would be doing some extra investigation myself to find, just, you know, ring, just do a, a little bit of cold calling to some other financial providers, just to make sure that that particular deal from the broker, from Westpac to you is the best, because what has happened, I'm not gonna, you know, say all brokers are tarred with the one brush, What's happened previously, many, many years ago now, a broker would have directed your loan to Westpac because he or she was going to get their best kickback themselves from, from Westpac as opposed to CBA. Yeah. Look, I've been in the mortgage broking for 10 years as well, too, and I know exactly that's, uh, that's what happens. I know there's uh, compliance laws against all that sort of stuff happening, but uh, we're also dealing with human nature as well, too. Yeah, and, absolutely, Nick. Yeah. Absolutely. And so it's always good to be prudent with it. Absolutely, couldn't agree more. Yeah. All right, well, look, we've, we've got uh, time for some uh, questions. We've got a, a few questions uh, in the chat here as well. Um, so have got one here from Ron who uh, says that uh, he paid for an online printer in Australia uh, for his work with a credit card. So he paid for it with a credit card. Um, and there were two charges debited from his uh, account. First payment is for the invoice. Then he said the second payment is a surcharge from their parent company in Europe. They claim mm -hmm. that's part of their terms and conditions. Is this a correct practice to uh, add a second charge to your card? No. Simple no, answer. De def um, to the best of my knowledge, no, it's not. So that printer company, yeah, sure, could have charged their surcharge, but um, how they've actually done that in my eyes is incorrect and immoral. So Ron, I, I would, um, I hope that you've only purchased that printer uh, recently, but I would certainly take it up with them. I, in my eyes, I don't think that's correct. Mm. Yeah, it seems in amazing. my eyes, that invoice should have showed the cost of the printer plus a card surcharge total amount payable. Because- so Not two invoices or two charges. No, definitely not. All right. 
Uh, so what did Terry, oh, Terry says, oh, I got a 1.5% reduction on our interest rate on our mortgage after one phone call and two emails. Well worth the effort. Probably the best yes. return on investment for your time. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, Terry. Um, what I would do is, is um, to anyone else there too, that I would perhaps just make a diary note, say for yearly, you know, um, just to follow that up. So just make a, a yearly call to your bank to say, right, you know, it's been 12 months since I've spoken to you or you've spoken to me, you know, what's the best rate there? And just put them, you know, put them to the task. Make them earn your business rather than them take your business. So I guess the status quo, if you don't question the status quo, the status quo will, will, will be they're not going to come like being a profitable uh, business that are uh, looking out for the uh, shareholders and maximising profits to uh, shareholders. Uh, right. why, why would they come to you and yep. uh, offer you uh, something lower unless they knew that uh, you were going to be moving or, or that um, you were ready to do something? That's right. Yep. So true. Yeah, I guess uh, that's that old thing. If you, um, if you don't ask, the answer is always no. <laughs> that's it. Excellent. Anyone else got uh, any questions uh, here Excuse for me? Mark? Um, he's, I've certainly learned a thing or two from you uh, today, Mark. I always wondered so quite what you did, but now I've got a uh, very good understanding of it all. And uh, there's some things there that I need to go and uh, have a look at uh, in uh, our transactions as well, too. Would it be okay if I ask the question, Nick? Go yeah, ahead, sure, Stephen. So, so, Mark, if I understand it, you're a disruptor because obviously there's the, the banks are out there doing what they're doing. Um, I'm, I'm still not 100% certain as I understand where the problem lies in, in other than the fact that if I'm a vendor and I'm not charging the right um, amount or I'm charging more than I should be, then I'm, I'm contravening the law. Um, and if I put a blanket 3% on and that covers everything, then, then I'm overcharging. And if I put a, the minimum on, I'm undercharging and, the, and, the, and I get charged the bank. So I, I understand the commercial risk there, I guess. Um, I'm not sure as a consumer because I don't understand the law that I'm going to, you know, I'm going to arc up about 50 cents on a cup of coffee. Yeah. I'm just going to go and buy the coffee at another shop. What's to stop the banks from just once they figure out that this is an issue and, and there's going to be the ACCC going in and doing all of these, these um, investigations and, and it starts to hit, you know, the media, what's to stop them from just replicating your, your model and putting in a terminal that does the calculations? I would have thought that that's a fairly yeah. straightforward. Um, a very good question, Stephen. Um, it's something that I've wondered for quite a while myself. Um, I believe the ANZ is dabbling into FPOS terminals at the moment that provide surcharge as well. They seem to be, from, from my uh, market research I do, and I do that quite often, they seem to be about the only bank, you know, looking at that at that factor. But what I did learn in my banking days with, with Westpac for that length of time is that FPOS terminals were like the cream on the cake for the banks. That's that's where we made our that's where we made our money. And I mean mean big money. So primarily, you know, they're a little bit hesitant in changing something that's providing them the, their cream on their cake. But it, it's very, very interesting now with obviously the Banking Royal Commission having uh, you know, concluded for now uh, that there's still some findings from that that still haven't uh, sort of filtered through to the banks and to their operational divisions. So I do believe that maybe when that does fully filter through, that that may lead to some sort of change that way. But... Um, yeah, it's, it's a case now where, as I said to you, um, as I said earlier, you know, we, so, you know, surcharge is, is uh, a very, very, um, let me say, it can be a very good vehicle for a business, but it can also be a very, very, um, let me say, um, damaging vehicle for a business if it's not handled in the right way and in the right context. So, but um, yeah, I, I do think that the bank, some of the banks will start to look at, at doing this anyway. Did you have any other questions there, Stephen? Yeah, yeah no, no, thanks. Thanks, Mark. 
Good. You're right, Stephen. Ron, you've got a question there. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm still trying to get my head around this because... Uh, <laughs> Don't worry about that, Ron, so am I. <laughs> uh, because uh, really, the, the way I said, the, sur uh, the question of surgery surcharge is, do I charge or do I not charge? Yep. And um, you're, you're saying if you do it the correct way, uh, you can benefit from it. But I'm just still trying to work out what is yep. the correct way. Yeah, okay. Um, if I can just, um, just open that up a little bit further, please, Ron. Um, you have an online business or you have a shop? Uh, yeah, yeah, no, yeah, I, yeah. I, uh, I have an online, online. Well, actually, it's an online business, but I do... Well, I did do trade shows when they were available. Yeah, yeah, look. Yeah, a little bit difficult to do those at the moment. <laughs> uh, yeah, so... So our, so our payments have been um, uh, online uh, payments and also at the trade show. Uh, I use Square at the trade show. Yeah, yeah, great. Um, as a as, uh, quick payment. Yeah, if I can just um, turn that around for a moment. So I'll just break that into two parts. So. Let's say that you're going to trade shows now and you're using Square. Um, Square is an excellent device. Um, however, what I found with Square is that it's um, last year there was a conference, a three speakers speaking here on the Gold Coast at an event. Um, I went to try and buy their books before they spoke. And I was in a queue, you know, 10 people in front of me and I hadn't moved in 15 minutes. I'm thinking, what's going on? And the three speakers had a square device each. And what they're finding is they're having trouble in getting connectivity. So I'm not saying that squares, you know, every square device is going to have connection issues, not at all. But that's something to consider. So what happens is that when people use my FPOS terminal as, as a solution to, as opposed to square, my FPOS terminal can identify what particular card someone is paying, which card people are using. So if they're using that one there, they'll, they'll, it will pass on an FPOS surcharge specifically for that card. With that one being a MasterCard, it will pass on the MasterCard. So the technology I've built into this FPOS terminal enables it to identify which card is being used and to apply the relevant surcharge for the car. So that's in the trade show context. Is um, it touch, touch and go? Yeah, yeah, you know, I, have, I have tap and go, the whole, you know, use your watches and your rings and everything, like, you know, all the technology. With, with the online payments, so <clears throat> with that, is that we set, it's um, presently just on 2.1% that we we pass on surcharge. So people say, oh, gee, that, that's a bit high. Why my rates, and once again, I go back to that analogy comparing apples with oranges. My rates are always going to appear, you know, people say, oh, I've got an online, an online payment gateway with Westpac. They only charge me 1.86%. My rates are what we call um, graded rates. So what that means is that it's a rate as well as what's built in there is, is some service costs as well. So that's why we don't have primarily in most cases any monthly service fees. So once, once you meet a threshold of spending through your online payment gateway, we pass on the surcharge to those who are shopping, that the gateway itself is there will be no cost to the business for it. So that's why my rate is always a little bit higher with the facilities that I provide. So I hope did that. Uh, yeah, I, I can I can understand I can understand that. I, I suppose from uh, um, I'm thinking is uh, I don't pass I don't ask for that rate because you know a rate changes according to whether we do a, a tap and go or whether we do a manual entry. Uh, and the other, and, and quite often when I'm out and around and I make a sale, I just put that onto Square on my phone. Yeah. Just okay. Okay. So, so yeah. they're all, you know, they do charges, different rates for different methods yeah. of transaction. Yeah, so that FBOS term I spoke of, no matter if you tap and go 
will charge the respective rate to the respective card, no matter what card the person's shopping with. So that's the technology so that, of that. So that is, that's a separate unit to, uh, to an app. Yeah, yeah, it's just like, sorry, I'll use the, anal um, the example again. Just similar, but not the same as when you actually go in to um, buy your groceries at Woolworths or Coles, you know, the, oh, yeah. Like, yeah, so it's similar to, to that device. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sorry, Mark, can I ask, I, I, I just, I'm trying to understand the, the, you know, where all this comes from. Um, so if I choose not to pass on the surcharge as the, as the vendor, I wear that cost, Correct. right? So when I make the, so I can set my terminal up or can I set my terminal up so that it's, it's the surcharge is zero. Have I that ability? Yes, you do. Right, yep. okay. So when I buy the terminal or when I place the terminal in my store, there's some back-end software that says, what charge do you want to apply for this particular transaction? Yeah, ex exactly and right. That's, that's one only, you can only have one of those. You can't have multiple. No. So what, what you can do with, with the surcharge, a um, couple of different ways. So. When we're doing an application for whether it be a terminal. Yeah, I'm not talking about your product. I'm talking about, let's say Westpac or CBA. Oh yeah, yeah, yep. okay, sure, I, I, sure. Because I understand, I understand your technology and you know, it sounds that it's adaptable and I can, and it, and it, it's, it's, it recognizes the transaction. I'm talking about, let's say I don't want to do that. I, I don't want to buy yours and I'm happy to have Westpac's um, even though what it, you know, what the thing is, but can I, so I, is there a way of putting a zero surcharge on that and me wearing the cost? And if I choose not to, is it just, I can only have one option on the, yeah, on the surcharge, um, on the surcharge. Yeah, it, it's, it's a very, it put it this way, I'm going to answer that two ways. First way is that if you had an FPOS terminal with Westpac now, really what you're doing now, if you want to use it this way is, is you're effectively, wearing the surcharge now by Westpac debiting your business account every month mm -hmm. for the rental transactions and so, so forth. So you are certainly able then to go to, um, it's a very, very dangerous <laughs> game to play because what can happen is that you can provide a receipt to someone that you're charging a surcharge to and then you can have someone who has bought something the same from you where you've absorbed the surcharge yourself. Suddenly, and how does that, how does that happen? Um, if I, if I've set it up, if the system's set up, how does one person come in and be charged the surcharge and another person not be charged the surcharge? Yeah. What can happen is that um, you can, especially I'll have to use my, my terminal as an example. Now with my FBOS terminal, um, those in, you know, if it's your business, you can actually, you've got the ability to override the surcharge um, uh, software in the terminal. So in other words, sorry, just excuse me. <coughs> Effect, pardon me. So effectively what you could do right now is someone could come in right now and buy whatever from you and they will pay a surcharge. You could then go in to the next person who's come in who may be spending more money with you every month than that previous person. And you could actually waive the surcharge and that surcharge amount, whatever it is, would be debited to your business account. Mm -hmm. The game, the dangerous game I, I see that you'd be playing there. Sorry, sorry, sorry Mark, that, that, was, that wasn't my question. Sorry, I, I, I understand that. I understand what you're saying, but that wasn't my question. My question was it, at, the, at the terminal that I have, um, can I absorb that? Can I just make a business decision and say, I'm going to absorb all of this. I'm not going to charge the surcharge. And so therefore I'm not contravening any laws. Correct. And, and I, all I'm doing is it's, I now see that as a business expense. It's, just a, it's just a cost. Yep, if, I, if I choose to charge the surcharge because someone is using an FPOS, machine, uh, FPOS card as opposed to a, bank card or a MasterCard, 
then the bank charges me a different rate for those. It's a Correct. 60 cents transaction or a 2% or a 3%. So my, my option then is either to have your terminal or have a minimum 60 cents for every transaction. And then I just wear the difference between the 60 cents and the 2%. And the charges. Yes. Right. Okay. All right. Is that, and that's pretty much it. Yep, absolutely. Right, okay. All right, now I understand. Thank you. So, so, so can I just clarify, just had a question, Stephen, also of um, whether those machines are actually programmable. Can you program it, uh, can you program it for different surcharges? Or, uh, or can you program it at all? Are you just doing it manually, deciding, you know, this is going to cost $4, uh, I'm just going to add 30 cents onto it? Or um, does the machine actually do the calculations? Yeah, the machine... Nick, the machine does the calculations for you. So all you, all your staff basically do is if you're in the Gloria jeans or, you know, coffee again, you would just put in the amount that the person is spending with you. You indicate what card they're using and then the terminal will actually allocate the surcharge based on that information. But, but a Westpac, <laughs> for instance, you can't do that with. No. Yeah, okay. All right. Good. All right, well, I think we're... Uh... We're at time, so um, so thanks very much, uh, Mark, for uh, coming in and uh, uh, you know sharing your knowledge, your expertise. Um, it's certainly been very enlightening uh, for me, and there's been some good questions and comments coming through yeah. on uh, chat as well. So thanks very much um, for coming in. No, any time, Nick. L loved it. Excellent, excellent. Now, for those that uh, that are here, we do have a uh, a prize draw today, I believe. Is that right? We do. Excellent. So uh, what have you got for us, uh, Mark? Um, unfortunately, with my, uh, I've got a $40 gift voucher. So whether someone would like a $40 Dan Murphy's voucher, a $40 Woolies voucher, Coles voucher. Excellent. Uh, does it have a surcharge on it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, surcharge free, Stephen. <laughs> Excellent. All right. So, um, as, as ever, the, um, uh, the, to uh, actually win it, you, act you have to be here to win. So those that are here are uh, in the running for it. Um, I'm hoping for Dan Murphy's. Oh, my name's not in there. All right, let's spin the wheel and see who's the, uh, the lucky winner tonight. And that looks to be Stevie. Is uh, Stevie here still here? Yes, Stevie's here. So uh, Stevie, good night. Please have, could you pop your email address into chat for me, please? That would be very good. All right. So, uh, how did you get in touch with you, Mark? What's the best way of doing that? Um, look, um, whatever's easier, whatever's easier for, for each of you. So, my mobile number, if you just want to have a chat, is 0419 762 478. I'll tell you what, my. my just tongue to it. I'll just yep. put it in the chat. That might make it easier. All right. So you're happy for people to phone you, email you. Yep. That's it. Watch Telegraph. Yeah. Whatever works. <laughs> yeah, yes. Thank you. Excellent. And there are no, no dumb questions in my world. Certainly not. Well, uh, there is in the banking world, but uh, you're here on the other side of the offence yeah. now. So uh, nothing's done. All right, well, look, uh, thanks once again, uh, everyone, for coming along tonight. Just a reminder for tomorrow. We have uh, office hours tomorrow. That's at 10 a.m. tomorrow morning. That's a uh, no agenda, open discussion for you to uh, bring your uh, questions or if you have a topic that uh, you'd like to discuss about your uh, online uh, marketing strategies, an app that you want, app recommendations, uh, feel free to come along. It's just an hour uh, uh, tomorrow morning. Uh, the link is in chat if you want to uh, come along and register for that. Um, so that's uh, office hours. Uh, and make sure you bring a coffee because it's, uh, it's that sort of chat. We're, we're not going to charge uh, for the coffee and there'll be no surcharges tomorrow either. Um, and um, for uh, the next uh, one of these um, business owners smashing online, it uh, happens every Tuesday at 6 o'clock. Uh, and uh, so you can register for it now, I think. I believe the, uh, the link is in chat. Uh, it is in chat right now. So uh, feel free to register for that. Uh, I think next week, off the top of my head, is about um, 
uh, Facebook and online uh, paid advertising on Facebook and online marketing. Don't quote me, but I think that's what it is. But we will confirm that when we uh, put out the uh, information um, uh, over the week. Um, I'm going to miss you, Martin, if you're not there tomorrow, because you always bring uh, good uh, discussion uh, questions. All right. Um, what else did I have? I th oh, the other thing I meant to say is to save the chat. Just remember to open the chat down below. And uh, once you've got it open, click on the three dots on the bottom right and click save. Uh, and that way you will get uh, all of the links that we uh, shared in there uh, today. So once again, Mark, thanks very much for uh, spending your evening with Pleasure. us tonight. Anytime, Nick. And thanks Thank everyone, everyone. for uh, coming along and uh, look forward to seeing you all again either tomorrow or uh, next week. Go out and have a great week. Okay. Thanks very much, everyone. Bye.